Absolute. And close that. Okay. Oops. I broke everything. Yay! <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to. Hello. Hi. Welcome to this week's learning space. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hello. We, have, we have an interesting co uh, connection system going this time. Uh, as you guys know, I'm your host Nicole Gallucci. Um, and my co-host through the wall is Georgia Bracey. Hello, everybody. Although, as, as some of you guys saw from my post last night, uh, in a few months she will no longer be just a wall away. <laughs> uh, I'm, going to, I'm moving to New Hampshire uh, and uh, for a job in August, uh, but we hope to continue doing shows even though I can't run into her office when my computer freaks out. <laughs> uh, we'll just pretend. We'll just pretend. It's okay. <laughs> um, so welcome. Thank you guys for joining us here on Learning Space. As usual, you can use the Q&A app. Um, if you are watching this somewhere on YouTube or Google+, Plus, it says Q&A, join the conversation over in the corner. Click on that to join the Q&A app and use that for comments and questions. Um, and as Nancy Graziano also points out in the Q&A, uh, leave it for um, questions and answers that come to us on the panel. Um, so you can also use the comment thread, um, which I'll be trying, I'll, I occasionally try and keep an eye on. Um, <laughs> Uh, on the Google Plus page to uh, to continue chatting if you'd like. Um, thank you guys again for the congrats. And it seems like everyone's really hungry. Um, and yeah. that could be because of our topic. <laughs> so we have with us by video, we have Steve Howell. Uh, unfortunately, the lower third is not working, so write that down. <laughs> write that down. <laughs> a little sticky note on your shirt. I have actually used a sticky note on my shirt before, but that's because I <laughs> um, So Steve Howell is joining us from NASA. And on the phone, on my phone here, wait, here's my camera. On my phone, there's Bill. <laughs> Bill Yoxis. <laughs> Hi, Nicole. <laughs> so that looks Bill, just like him. Bill yeah. is coming to us on speakerphone from, uh, you're like in the middle of cooking right now. Yes, I'm making a blueberry cobbler. Oh, he's making oh. blueberry cobbler. In New York, New York City, right? Yes. I can tell by the... the downtown. Oh, downtown. Awesome, awesome. I can smell the blueberries. <laughs> so if you're in downtown Manhattan right now and you smell blueberries, go say hi, Bill. <laughs> That's right. So we brought you guys on to talk about... So um, we, we've talked about edible astronomy projects before, but our... Our version of edible astronomy is rather um, simple. Uh, <laughs> we've we've done some, some uh, edible astronomy activities, like you know planets, like using different sized foods for the planets. We we um, Pamela, of course, made cake pops both at home and in the office, which didn't look anything like the planets we tried to make them look like, but they were delicious. <laughs> um, but you guys totally took it to the next level with your gastronomy. And exoplanets. So, uh, do you want to get started? First of all, tell us what is gastronomy, uh, and how does it relate, and how do you guys relate it to exoplanet science? Oh, you want, go ahead, Steve. One of us should answer that. Is that it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right. So, um, let me tell you a little bit about uh, myself and how I relate to sure. exoplanets, and then how I got related with Bill and this gastronomy thing. So I'm what's called a project scientist for some NASA space missions for the Kepler mission and the new version of that, the K2 mission. And one of the um, most exciting things scientifically we do with those missions is we search for planets that orbit other stars, and those are called exoplanets. So we have found about 4,000 planets or planet candidates that orbit other stars other than our sun, and they're in uh, that sort of mostly in one patch of the sky where the Kepler Space Telescope looked, we now are looking at other parts of the sky with the K2 mission. So what we learned about those planets is they come in all kinds of sizes and shapes, and they come in all kinds of uh, conditions on their surfaces of hot and cold and high-pressure atmospheres, and maybe they're covered with water and all sorts of physical things, which is how we relate them to cooking, because cooking is really just cooking is physics and chemistry, just like the science I do with exoplanets. So Bill and I thought the cool thing we could do is put science and cooking together, which of course you can't separate, that's the way you cook, and learn about uh, a little bit of science and a little bit of cooking and use our mutual skills and have a, a lot of fun in the meantime. Cool. So Bill, why don't you do your part? Yeah, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and, and how you got involved in this? 
Yes. So um, I've been a professional chef for a long time, and uh, I met Steve at a uh, conference, and um, and he told I sort of said, well, what do you do? And he gave pretty much what he just said. So as probably many people um, watching and listening, my jaw just dropped open, and I was like, oh, my God, this guy looks at other planets in the universe. Um, how cool is that? So I, I had already had some contacts with um, chemists and physicists um, because uh, I had participated in a course at Harvard called Science and Cooking that had been launched by Farhan Adria and in the physics department there with Michael Brenner and um, Dave Waite. So I had some of the basic vocabulary um, and uh, so I asked Steve if he would join me at the next uh, class that we had, and he did. And um, he just killed it. I mean, we had uh, we talked about light spectrum, about spherification and surface tension, all of these things which exist in my kitchen and on his planet light years away. <laughs> <clears throat> Yeah, so that's a really cool connection is we both work in the same world and, and, and mostly we can eat Bill's stuff and we mostly can't eat my stuff. But. <laughs> um, well, not yet. But um, <laughs> thing for what I would say as for a chef, I, one of the things that chefs do in, the, in their professional life is always try to understand their sources. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, as a chef, we, we'd like to have, you know, the best produce or – the best raised uh, beef or livestock. We want to know who the farmer was that grew our our ingredients. So for me, this is the next step in understanding our ingredients. Is understanding it on the let's call it the atomic or molecular level. So the more I understand about how a dairy product behaves, or a, or a protein, or a a foam or a polymer, then the more, the better cook I can become. That's awesome. And you, you have become a better cook because of all of this, you would say? Oh, absolutely. I have a better understanding. I'll give you an example. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I make a lot of pastry, and in pastry there's all kinds of mm -hmm. foams, and the behavior of foams I understood on a sort of instinctual level with uh, – egg bite meringue, whipped cream, um, mousses, chocolate mousse, etc. But when I've been working with Steve, he began to uh, explain to me like how a foam works, how the, how the surface tension of the bubbles are uh, connected to one another, and, and what is a hydrophilic and hydrophobic element that can become a surfactant and prolong the life of that foam. So many foams that I would make maybe only have a few minutes but uh, if we use an ingredient like a uh, lecithin, which um, is a hydrophobic and hydrophilic uh, ingredient, we can prolong the life of that foam into minutes or even hours. Mm -hmm. So to create a more stable and a more luscious sort of foam, learning about those principles helped me a lot. Cool. Yes, and so likewise, so Bill has, has made me a better scientist out of all of this. <laughs> <laughs> because when, when I study exoplanets now or, or I study other things in science, I, I'm always thinking of what's really going on there because I want to return that information to the work we do together and I want to always see how we can relate that to food and what kinds of food things are the real science here. And I, so I tend to understand things or try to understand things now. All these little details you take for granted on just a, you know, a much more detailed level. I mean, we've been working this week, one example, we, where we've been sending emails and photos back and forth at all hours of the day and night on a, uh, a, a, a topic where we're trying to get pH understood to the general community. So this is the, the measurement, the scientific measurement of how acidic something is or how basic it is. And we've all played around with baking soda and vinegar. And baking soda and vinegar are amazing compounds, amazing things. They have a very acidic pH that vinegar does, and they have a very basic pH that baking soda does. And if you eat these things, you would probably say they both taste equally awful, um, but that's because your taste buds, and we can bring taste into this, which is clearly a great part of cooking, uh, your taste buds can tell you something about acids and bases. 
And you can also have fun by putting these together, and not only do you get the little volcano we all did in third grade or something, but if you mix them together in the right amount, what you have left over is pure water and an inert ingredient that tastes a little salty. So if you would try to drink vinegar, you would say that's awful. And if you would drink a solution of baking soda, you would say that's awful. But the neat chemistry that's involved here, and it's a chemistry that's involved in cooking, uh, is you mix them together and all of a sudden you make water and you can drink it just fine and it doesn't taste awful at all. So it's just one of those amazing things and, and we've been looking at how you can use cabbage to measure which is an acid and which is a base and all, all kinds of interesting cooking and science things. So it's just, we, we do this every week and it's a blast. Not, not always pH. We have different topics. Cool. Where do you do, I mean, do you do demonstrations around the country? Where, where do you do these uh, demonstrations like what we saw at the, uh, the article from Gemini? Yeah, well, it's, it's kind of neat that way as well. So Bill has a lot of connections in the, in the cooking world, as you might imagine, and I have a lot of connections in the science world and, and NASA things. And so we've been kind of going to each other's conferences and going to each other's work, basically. And uh, Bill was out at the observatory with me last summer. He's coming out again this summer, and we're making an astronomer out of him. And, of course, we all benefit because he cooks for us. <laughs> And uh, Bill was getting me involved with restaurants and chefs, and anyway, it's just become a real wonderful thing, and we're trying to really use this as an educational opportunity for uh, mostly, you know, younger people and older people alike, I think. Cool. Uh, we have a question. Yeah, I, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Nicole. No, go ahead, go ahead. I was just going to say something that um, Steve mentioned that I'd like to piggyback off of is the um, the the general community of not only people who are interested in science, but people who are interested in both food and science. And I was just reading yesterday about um, a project that Alan Alda, the actor uh, from MASH, if you remember uh, him, he's, uh, he's very involved in um, science and also in helping scientists to communicate to the general public, which I think is crucial, crucial in terms of our public policy and and uh, how, who we elect to um, political office. So he's working with scientists and doing like actors training mm -hmm. so that um, they can explain, especially with doctors, for example, explain to the layman what's going on in, in accurate but uh, sort of generally understood language. Yeah, I've read about that before, and someone just sent me that recent article. I haven't gotten a chance to read it yet. Um, but That's he really does, cool. He does, like, improv training yes. for, for yeah. scientists. I so want to do that. <laughs> at, uh, yeah, it's at Stony Brook in, yeah. uh, in part of um, the State University of New York. Right. And um, yeah, he's working with medical researchers um, to so they can at the, the very high level of like genomic research and and all this uh, very complex science so it can be explained to the patient. Mm -hmm. So do you find people learn uh, both about astronomy and about cooking from these events? Because I know I know I very basic <laughs> about the science of cooking and, and baking. Well, definitely the cooking, yeah. As I said, like the example I gave earlier, um, you begin to understand how an egg white meringue works mm -hmm. through this kind of demonstration. Well, I, I'll tell you a story which I think is, is answers your question. To me, it was one of the greatest moments Bill and I have had together. We were doing a, a show together in Hawaii or a lecture or a show. I'm not sure what it is. A show sounds like we're just acting up there, which, you know, we kind of do too, but we do do some teaching as well. There was a, a um, young boy in the audience whose grandmother happened to be involved with the planetarium where we were giving the show, and the young boy came up after, and he just could not leave the, the slime. We had made slime. He couldn't leave the slime alone, and Bill and I had made an anti-gravity machine, which is just a blast, and we make them all the time now. They're really fun. Uh, you'll have to come and see us sometime so you can see our anti-gravity machine, what? but he was fascinated by that. And the next day, the grandmother sent both of us an email and said, uh, I forget his name, I'm sorry for his name, but she said, he came up to me last night and he said, Grandma, I want to help you make dinner, and I want to do it every night. Ooh. And so just all of a sudden he was interested in being involved in food and preparation of the food and cooking and eating, and, and that's, a great, that's a great thing right there. So I think that's the kind of stuff we inspire. It doesn't really matter if they know, even know what they're doing, but to get them involved in, 
learning something, healthy eating, good food, and understanding of that, that science is involved in your daily life. Very cool. Um, let's see. Uh, <laughs> uh, Nancy Graziano, um, who lives in Jersey, so not far from you, Bill, uh, says, uh, since, <laughs> since you're located in, in New York City, you need to hook up with Emily Rice for an Astronomy on Tap event. I think that was two weeks ago. Um, there's a group that does uh, cool, fun astronomy um, events in bars in around New York City. So, you should oh, check cool. them out. Oh. And, and along those lines, cool. apparently everybody's in that kind of mood today. Adam Synergy asks if there are <laughs> Kepler cocktails that go along uh, with, with this <laughs> gastronomy. Yeah, we've, we've done uh, things with, with like science cafes where we get little pitches in bars and things, and it sounds a very similar thing. Those are, those are a lot of fun, and um, especially with the food component, you can start talking about, of course, bubbles and beer, which are just spheres and a fascinating subject. Yeah, and another guest we had on a while back, Ann Sauer, does uh, gastronomy demonstrations at uh, Convergence, which is a sci-fi convention. Um, and so, yeah, I'm pretty sure we had alcoholic bubbles of some sort <laughs> on one of those nights. Uh, so I, we have some pictures here from your demonstrations. Uh, do you want to show some of these, and, and you can talk a little bit about the the activities? Oh sure. So yeah. so first one, since we've been talking about foam, this looks like <laughs> a giant foam tower of some sort. Um, do you want to uh, talk a little bit about this one? Uh, that's a good one. <laughs> What's going on there? Yeah, so this was uh, at the Taste of the World, the New York Times uh, food show in New York City recently uh, in January. And so this is one of the, the foams that, that we make that kind of demonstrates the dramatic effect of foams. Um, if, you, if you notice at the bottom of that column of foam, there's a, a, a glass container down there. Um, all, all that foam came out of that glass container in, in about a microsecond <laughs> and, and shot up very high and then came back down to the earth as a big pile of smoking foam. Um, so, so this is a, a foam that uh, demonstrates, as I said, the properties of foam. and demonstrates how you can trap gases into spherical bubbles. And this foam uh, lasts a very long time. And we've, uh, th this foam, as it is right here, is not something you can eat. Um, it, you can, but it, it really tastes bad and you don't want to. Um, but we are working on a version of this uh, that you can eat, which uh, would be fabulous. But the, the real neat thing here is besides foams, this entire demonstration is basically a uh, instant cake. So you can put egg whites in this and you can put um, some material in to make uh, uh, bubbles. In this case, we use bubbles of oxygen. Uh, but it's the same thing that happens when you bake a cake. It's just we do it in less than a second as compared to putting a cake in the oven for uh, 350 degrees for so long. So it's, it's kind of a, a very fast cooking demonstration and, and showing a dramatic use of the chemistry that goes on when you bake many products. Is this the one that requires a dish detergent as listed on the, the blog? Is that why um, it's not edible? Uh, it, it does, and, and we've, uh, we, we've now come up with some other forms. So dish detergent by itself is, is not poisonous, but it really tastes bad. Yeah, it's icky. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've tried it. <laughs> well, we wouldn't recommend uh, that recipe uh, <laughs> to try at home, but um, it does display, and th that was particularly for a very young audience. We had kids there from like 8 to 14, so we try to make them uh, understand some of these basic principles in a very dramatic and colorful way. Mm. So um, they, had, they were doing countdowns, and then we would change the color back and forth, and they would... Uh, shout out what color they wanted. So uh, it, it really engages uh, young kids on both the cooking and science. And as uh, Steve mentioned earlier, we've seen a lot of kids going into the kitchen and cooking with their um, parents because of these demos. That's fabulous. Do you uh, create most of these little demos that you do and does it come from real recipes and you mentioned you're kind of tweaking like this one maybe to make it more edible how much of your own ideas do you get to put into these things you know it's well, it's, it's a very combination. collaborative so Steve and I uh, we talk about the food and the science and then that that's a, this example of foams is a good a good way to talk about it because uh, we're replacing the um, what is making those bubbles with 
edible materials mm -hmm. so that you can actually have a truly an instant cake that would be um, that you could consume. Oh my God, I want. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Oh, uh, so what about what are some of the other demos um, that that might be edible? Did you want to share? <laughs> Well, there's another cake which is uh, similar to this, um, which is we make uh, we put together um, egg, sugar, flour, sesame paste, and um, and we mix it up. We put it in one of these whipped cream foamers, the kind of where you make whipped cream at home. Yeah. Mm. Then we charge it up with um, with gas. Then we we squirt that into siphon it into a, a paper cup that has been um, butters on the inside, and we put that in a microwave for about 20 seconds, and that's that's for us that's a long time, a cooking time. So in 20 seconds, we can make a sponge cake out of this material. Yeah. Again, we're, what we're teaching uh, people is not only the coagulation of eggs, but how carbon dioxide really is released slowly out of most materials, like when you open a bottle of soda, it takes a long time for those bubbles to, to pop out of it. <laughs> yeah, Bill, Bill forgot to mention one key ingredient in that instant cake, and that's chocolate. <gasps> and it's a lovely, <laughs> lovely <laughs> <laughs> so, so you're gonna email us this recipe, right? <laughs> Although I don't think I have that whipped cream making machine. <laughs> oh, they're they're pretty available now. Cool. Yeah. Well, I was um, gonna ask about how easy, like, for I'm thinking of teachers actually, because of very engaging, of course, with young kids and helping them learn science, and then of course cooking too. And I think some of these could definitely be used in like a regular classroom by teachers. And I don't know if you've had any teachers do this or have thought about that because um, of course you want it to be safe and have materials easily available and but cooking kinds of ingredients sort of you know usually fit that category. So do you have any teachers trying this stuff out? Um, well I can start on that. Yeah we do. My um I, I, someone very close to me, my partner is a high school science teacher, um, and um, besides getting a, a number of cool things to do, um, um, he also is working with her home economics teacher to develop a, a cooking chemistry class where there's a little more science and a little more uh, um, non-standard recipes, so to speak. Um, but I think that this is a, a, a comment Bill, or a question Bill really should comment on because he is really leading the charge for all of us and, and we've been working on this together as well in terms of education and cooking, um, both with people at Harvard and, and schools in New York City and um, trying to get uh, public schools to have science food. So the food they get at their cafeteria is based on science they're learning that week in their classes. <laughs> uh, so Bill, maybe you should comment on your efforts there. Yes, ab absolutely. Um, the, um, we, there's a number of programs. Uh, one of them is, uh, I'll mention, is at Carleton College in Minnesota. And a uh, great guy there who's a, stu a senior there, uh, Bayou Minirecto, he has a uh, cooking club that has one-third of the student population belonging to the cooking. I shouldn't say cooking club because it's a cooking and science club. And one third of the student population belongs to this club. <laughs> so it's a small school, about 2,800 students, but 800 of them are um, are in the. That's ridiculous. And oh my God, that's amazing. <laughs> that's amazing. I want to go to that school. Yeah. So, um, and then I'll back a little because it's very interesting uh, to your question about how this could be um, done in in science classes and all of these ingredients are available we don't we don't uh, you know ask Steve to order things from NASA or anything like that <laughs> we just buy them in like in grocery stores or health food stores so it's all available to uh, to any right. um, consumer and I'll give the best example I think and this came from his partner Sally um, who told us well why don't you show kids how to boil water with an ice cube. <laughs> Interesting. How do you do that? Uh, oh, it's, it's, uh, it works a lot like the atmosphere of Mars. 
<laughs> yeah, so that's a that's a good one. How do you do that, Steve? Oh, okay. Well, we've our secret. So did you want to me? Yeah, so the, the trick is you, um, if you, for example, took a large bucket of water to the moon or to Mars and you threw it on the surface, um, it, would, it would boil away very quickly. Yeah. Um, but, of course, that's, when we think of water boiling, we think of water being very hot. Okay. Um, but you have to get it hot on the Earth to have the water uh, get enough energy to basically defy gravity, to go from being a liquid to a gas and break out of that liquid state. But if you go to a place with no atmosphere, like the moon, uh, you can boil water at, at, at uh, very low temperatures because the, there's no atmosphere to provide a pressure. So it's very low pressure there or zero pressure. So if you build a device, and our device is basically a beaker with a cork on top, mm. and you can create a low pressure atmosphere inside that beaker, uh, you then can get the water to boil by using ice to cool down uh, the temperature in there and actually make the water colder, which allows it to boil. Wow. So it's a very interesting uh, experiment. It sounds crazy, but that's the neat science about it. It's sort of like the idea is of taking something out of your freezer and you're going to warm it up, so you put it in your refrigerator. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. We get that uh, reaction when we do dry ice demos with dry ice. Um, oh, dry ice. Is, you know, do you, they, they see the, the gas and the smoke pouring off of it, and I'm holding it with to hands, you can't touch it, and they're like, it's really hot, right? And I'm like, put your hand over it and tell me, is it hot? And they're like, oh, it's cold. Um, <laughs> being at a ridiculously low temperature. Yep, um, exactly. Those things are really neat because you challenge people's thoughts, right? Their daily occurrences and what, yeah. what things really are. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, cold smoke, what is that? <laughs> mm -hmm. So, uh, since we did talk about cocktails, there's a there's a picture that looks like, oops, screen share, uh, serving some kind of, of drink here. Uh, and there's actually a picture of, of uh, Bill serving this out since we only have you on phone, so there's Bill for everybody. <laughs> um, so what's going on with this one? Steve, you can see it. <laughs> I can see it. Yeah, Maybe Bill. You can, start it. you can start it, and then he can. Oh, no, you can't describe it. This is uh, you can't see it. This is the drink that uh, we made at the planetarium as the opening cocktail. Oh. Kind of oh right, right. Oh yeah, that was that was really fun. A uh, great way to start off the uh, the session, and um, it's uh, it's it's a hibiscus. The base of it is a hibiscus. A very strong hibiscus uh, infusion. So um, we put hibiscus into hot water, and then it, it leaches out, of course, all these antioxidants, and you get this really deep ruby red uh, sort of tea. And this is also a chance for us to talk about diffusion and how uh, molecules intermingle at what rate and what density and how that's all affected. And then we um, we served it, I think, with a uh, lychee. Like there was a lychee, I think, over right. the, the cocktail glass, with held by a toothpick. And um, I think we had some mint in there. But then in the the actual uh, sort of punch bowl, we um, we threw some dry ice in there, and of course it, it smokes and bubbles uh, continuously, which. Uh, was a great way to start off to our, our little reception for our uh, science talk at the planetarium in Hawaii. Yeah, this also, Bill, Bill can't see the picture, but it also had a, an orange juice foam on top as well. Okay. That sounds really delicious. Yeah, it was very good. Yeah, it was kind of a, yeah, like a milkshake. So you said this is a lychee? <laughs> What's a lychee? I'm... Oh, maybe I said lychee, lychee. It's a... Uh, it's a, a fruit from Asia that is um, very sweet with sort of a lemony background to it. I guess lychee is how some people L Y C H E E. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So they're very good. They're nice and sweet, and they're interesting looking. And and we try, you know, as as with food goes, and also it's nice for different sciences to have different textures, different colors, different flavors. Sort of mix them all together to really fool your brain and your head and get you thinking. Cool. Very cool. Um, so what other demos do you want to share? I know there's slime, there's something about fruits, fruit spheres. Um, maybe you want to talk a little <laughs> bit about the anti-gravity. Where do you want to take that next? 
Oh, the anti gravity. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many. Uh, go ahead, Steve. You grab it. Well, I was just gonna. I was probably gonna start with spheres. So spheres has been one of the things we've we've done since the beginning because spheres are just everywhere and and we bring lots of bubbles with us and we blow bubbles and get kids to blow bubbles and talk about that planets are spheres. Uh, spheres are a very common thing in the entire universe and spheres are so important in cooking. Uh, for example, if you cut open a loaf of, of bread, in particular one that's made at a good bakery or in your house or something, you, you see inside of it all these holes, all these spherical holes that were created uh, with carbon dioxide from the yeast while that bread was baking. And so we really can tie spheres into all kinds of things. And then Bill is uh, an expert and has now passed on his expert legacy to me. I, I am so gracious of this, Bill that uh, we, we make uh, spheres out of, out of mango juice or out of uh, various juices in these uh, neat reactions, these neat chemical reactions that Bill can tell you about, um, which we, we demonstrate as cross-linked polymers, but in, chemi or in food cooking, this is a very modern part of gastronomy now. So Bill, you want to talk about your spheres? Exactly, yeah. So, um, and, and we relate this to uh, Steve's uh, studies because they uh, they speculate that uh, yeah, there you go. these sort of uh, polymers on the exoplanets as well. But the process is this. There's two different kinds of gels. They're, they're basically made from uh, algae, sea, seaweed, and um, the gels are processed so that the, the seaweed is processed, rather, so that the calcium is taken out. And that makes that means that that uh, seaweed will not gel in the liquid. It will, if you add it to a mango juice or a tea or uh, tequila, um, you would it still stays liquid. But if you if you dip uh, a spoonful of that uh, alginated liquid into a substance that has calcium, then the gel reacts. But since you're if you dip it all at once then a sphere forms because as soon as those two, uh, the calcium hits the alginate, the cross-linked polymer is created. So only the outside shell, in other words, think of like egg yolk. Mm -hmm. So you have that very thin outside shell but liquid on the inside. Yeah. Well, the same thing happens with any liquid that you treat in this way. So you can do it with calcium, you can do it with milk or yogurt or like I say, margarita. Um, and they form these sort of, they're, they're actually more ovoid because they're, um, because of gravity, but if you, if you made them on the space shuttle, they would be completely spherical. And the process is called spherification, and it's, for Steve and I, it's kind of our, the most basic link to, uh, what he, uh, studies and what I study. As he said, it's a, the sphere is the most energy efficient shape in the universe. So if a ma if a mass body is large enough, it forms a sphere like the Earth and the moon and stars. If it's not large enough, then it becomes an asteroid or some oddly shaped um, you know celestial body. Yeah. And and the example that we like to use is with whales and elephants. So the bigger even mammals get, the more they begin to look like spheres. <laughs> wow. And so this picture I'm showing here, Steve, you nodded that this, this is correct, that I picked the sphere picture. Yeah, yeah, this is, a, this is a sphere. So you can see, if you look at that picture, that in, in the glass in the background there, you see the mango juice. Yeah, right. And then in the foreground, you can see on the lower left there, you can see two or three of the spheres that have basically, we just pour a little amount of the mango juice with one uh, gel into the other liquid, and as they drop to the bottom, they form a sphere and they gel on the outside. And then you can take them out and hold them in your hand or pop them in your mouth, and when you just lightly bite on them, they just explode in your mouth. They're very exciting. Cool. So are there any plans to actually make one, make a real spherical one on the uh, ISS? This year? <laughs> I'm you working send on that. Up to them, you're gonna send this up? No, no. Bill <laughs> and I have to go and do a demonstration oh. up there. <laughs> of course. Okay. That was cute. I love it. I love it. You have to be. No one's invited us yet, but. <laughs> yeah, that would kind of blow it for our anti-gravity device, though. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. That is true. <laughs> okay, so tell us a little bit more about the anti-gravity device. 
Uh, oh, okay. So this was um, th this was found. I, I have to admit, we, we kind of stumbled upon this by complete accident. Hang on, is this the um, one with the bubble? Yeah, it's the one with the bubble. So this is this is an old old demonstration that that many people have known about for decades actually, um, and before that, and it involves dry ice. So we were working in a in a kitchen in Hawaii, and we had a large container of dry ice because we were going to use some dry ice in our show. Because why and not? A large cooler. Oh yeah, we we cook like that very often. Yes. <laughs> Those glasses really help. Um, so they. <laughs> And so in the, in the bottom of this cooler was, a, I don't know, maybe five or ten pounds of dry ice. And, of course, dry ice sublimates. It turns from the, the solid directly back into the gas, back into carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide is heavier than air. So it forms this layer over top of the dry ice of carbon dioxide. But carbon dioxide gas is clear. So you can't see that the layer is there, but it is there. So I was just goofing off as I want to do, and I was blowing bubbles at Bill while he was trying to do something serious in the kitchen. <laughs> and you notice as these as these bubbles fell into the cooler, they they floated down to about a foot above the dry ice, and then they just hung in midair. They just stopped there, and it looked like you had just nice. frozen them from falling with anti gravity. Uh, but they of course had hit the carbon dioxide layer, and that was dense cool. enough to keep them from dropping any further. So it's really cool. But don't tell anybody the secret. Uh, I, you know, I think they did use carbon dioxide, but I saw something similar on Mythbusters. They were debunking a viral video uh, okay. of a little tinfoil boat floating on, floating in the middle of a fish tank on, you know, um, uh, invisible water, I think was what they were calling right. it. Right. Yeah, it's the same kind of idea. So you now have the picture of that is our anti-gravity device there in Hawaii. That's awesome. Um, <clears throat> so. All right, I'm getting some bubbles and doing that next time I do comments. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's so cool. That's so cool. Um, so uh, what plans do you guys have um, for taking these further? I know you're doing some of these when you travel. Um, do you have uh, write-ups planned or, or more um, something that could be brought up and given to teachers? Um, uh, we are working on those. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we would love to. We would love to make it available to teachers. As as we said, it's, um, all the ingredients are are generally available. Um, we're now going. I think our next uh, demo is going to be at the Intrepid uh, Air, Sea, and Space Museum uh, in New York City, which is the Intrepid is the aircraft carrier. I'm doing a happy dance because I went there as a kid. <laughs> oh, you did? Yeah, it is so much fun. Alan Silverman is the director of public programs and uh, we're working with the education department there. So that will be, uh, we will do that. And um, we're, hope we're putting together something for the World Science Festival in May in New York City. Nice. Uh, which we love doing that one. That is, it's just such it's a great audience. It's great scientists. I mean, they get everyone from uh, Brian Greene to Alan Guth and and uh, gravitational waves from very high-level theoretical physics uh, all the way over to uh, cooking and gastronomy. So that we love doing that one. Uh, and in, in the meantime, yeah, we're putting it together and uh, and working on a website. Cool. Awesome. Uh, there's one more picture I need to ask you what, what is going on here. Um, so, Steve, you can see this when it comes up. It's a long, flat sheet of something. <laughs> what is going on here? Ah, this picture, yeah. This was, um, we, we claim, and we, we claim this without any validity, but we claim this is the longest noodle, longest continuous noodle ever made. <laughs> <laughs> this was also at the New York Times Taste of the World where we had uh, kids and uh, the super chefs of America, uh, Greg Chang and company, were making noodles and letting the kids uh, basically roll their own noodles through noodle machines. And the idea was, how long of a noodle can you make? And you keep pressing it together and together. And then, as you can see in that picture, many people had to hold this. And so it's a great activity for being interactive with kids. They all had to put their hands under it, and it was, I don't know, 30 feet long or something by the time we yeah. were finished. And it's a real trick to run it through and then turn it over and run it through again and keep making it thinner and thinner to make it longer and longer. So, and we talk, of course, there a lot about uh, pasta and glutens and uh, how these things work with a little bit of water to actually stick together and 
uh, make food. Again, the, the chemistry and the food cooking is very much tied into it. So, Steve, what's uh, great, great lesson on elasticity. So then um, I mistakenly got the idea that we could just walk through uh, the entire trade show, all <laughs> like 20 or 30 of us kids. And um, so, but the one uh, principle of physics that I had forgotten about was dehydration. Oh, no. <laughs> so, so it started out to be a very flexible noodle and we could all hold it. But by the time, about 15 minutes later, as it had gone through all these air currents, it became very brittle and was just began to fall over all of our uh, these other sponsors' um, <laughs> little sort of displays. <laughs> so I was I think I'm persona non grata at the <laughs> saw Bill running out of the of the conference center. <laughs> oh my gosh! That's right. <laughs> So, Steve, I was wondering, what what are some of your favorite physics concepts have you talked about relating to exoplanets? So, I know we talked we talked about spheres. Um, like how uh, I was going to ask you how how polymer is um, important to exoplanets, for example. Oh, yeah, so we, we can go to polymers, but I'd like to say tell my favorite. Yeah. Of all the things Steve and I have done, the one that I thought was uh, sort of the most tightly related between. Um, Experience in the kitchen and experience on an exoplanet. So, um, one of the methods that Steve uses is uh, the light spectrum. And so, as these exoplanets uh, come close to the edge of their star, the light from the star goes through the atmosphere, if there is one. And uh, by analyzing the color of this light spectrum, Steve can tell what sort of uh, gases are in the atmosphere. So at our demo, he took uh, a number of different kinds of light lights. So neon light, argon light, uh, sodium, and these different kinds of lights. And then he had the audience hold up a, um, a gradient uh, slide to see how the light from these different gases showed up differently to your eyesight as they were splintered through this prism. And it was just amazing. You could, I thought it was such a, a great way for general public to understand this relatively complex uh, concept of splitting the light into its various colors to indicate what the gas in the atmosphere of those planets were. And uh, so it was an extremely successful connection between the two. Yeah, that was fun. Cool. Uh, and what about, I'm, I'm curious about the polymers as well. How does that relate to exoplanets? Well, there are, um, even in the large planets in our solar system, there are large uh, chain molecules that exist in their atmospheres. And we know from uh, studies, with, mostly with radio telescopes and astronomy, but not exclusively, that there are long-chain polymers in the universe all over the place. In our own galaxy, there's very complicated ones like acetylene and uh, things that are, are close to amino acids. And so these very long-chain molecules are types of polymers. So in cooking, polymers um, often come together to allow you to do what's called cross-linking. The spheres is one example of that. Um, Jello, for example, is another example. You mix two things together, and they grab onto each other and almost become a solid. They gel. And so there's a nice connection between polymers we know exist in planets' atmospheres and in the universe and polymers that you use every day in your kitchen. Cool. That makes me want to mention this article that came out a few uh, months ago um, ab about the um, astronomer who is, who is looking into deep space and into these star-forming uh, areas where uh, of dust and, and stellar particles are all coming together, and they were detecting um, aldehydes. So again, long chain molecules which uh, which were forming as part of this um, array of elements which are coalescing into gases, stars, and, and planets. And so these aldehydes, 
uh, also form what, what were called uh, glucoaldehyde, glucohydes. So basically, this stuff is being spread out. These amino acids are being spread out all over the, the universe. So my theory is that uh, sugar is the origin of life. But that may be sort of my own prejudicial, um, you know, as a chef. <laughs> Certainly a critical part. <laughs> I think it's, it's just really fun to, to look at some of these very elementary um, particles and see how they um, come together and and make up great food in the kitchen or, or make up theories of how, how it all began. Pretty cool. That's so fun. Is there anything about exoplanets or any science concept that you're still kind of trying to figure out how to show or demonstrate with the, a recipe or a food demo? Is there, or are you, I don't know, anything uh, left that you're kind of waiting for that, yeah, one <laughs> great, you know, demo, piece of food, recipe? Well, that's a, that's a good question. I think for me, um, you know, so we, we certainly don't know a lot about exoplanets. It's part of a learning experience. And as we go along learning, I, I think each new thing we learn, we, you know, Bill and I try to make into some food item as well or something. I think uh, clouds might be the next thing. We, we want to um, come up with a demonstration where we can actually form clouds, fairly large clouds, right in the crowd of people. Yeah. And, uh, oh, fun. That'll be a lot of fun. And then uh, if they're edible, that's even better. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Excellent. That's so why I actually used um, that image of Jupiter as the header for this hangout because I thought, ooh, wouldn't it be cool if we could see that kind of uh, you know hot Jupiter atmosphere? In yeah. 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 Very cool. Yeah. The, the cake pops we, we originally found had very detailed um, markings like that, and ours <laughs> didn't, didn't do that. Um, well, you know, one thing great with food demonstrations, it doesn't. If you make good food, and even if it doesn't come out quite right, you can still eat it. It's so delicious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, learn from your mistakes. And then eat them. <laughs> and eat them. Destroy the evidence. Yeah. Uh, Nancy Graziano chimes in that uh, chocolate is probably the source of all life, and and. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Which is a, I, I, I would I would lean towards that too. I would agree with that. Yeah. Well, we didn't, we didn't even get into chocolate because that's such a long conversation. But we I could talk about it all day. <laughs> yes. So um, the, the key science behind chocolate is crystallization, and um, there's been a lot of research actually in um, with many this around chocolate because. The fat crystals of chocolate are quite large, but only one, there's six different kinds of crystals. They're called beta crystals, one through six, and it's only one of them which, is, which actually is the um, sort of optimum crystal for, for good chocolate. It's number five. And the number five beta crystal is uh, what happens when chocolate is tempered, which means that uh, you raise you raise the temperature to melt it, then you lower it, and you raise it back up to degrees. And what that does is that eliminates all these other crystals and just maintains uh, beta crystal number five, which is the most um, yummy. I would call it's organized. It's, it's the way the crystals line up. So if you do it correctly, you, you wind up with a, a sort of brittle and shiny and slowly melting chocolate. If you don't do it correctly. You say you have a candy bar that melted on a hot day on the counter, and then you put it in the refrigerator. You probably will notice a kind of white film on the top. So that is not mold; it is the cocoa butter which is coming out of the chocolate. Because uh, act chocolate that you buy at the bar is actually an emulsion. It's a mix of cocoa butter, which is a fat, and cocoa mass, which is a liquid. But if you melt them and you don't bring them back in that beta-5 uh, configuration, they separate, yeah. and you get kind of a slimy, greasy <laughs> substance, which doesn't crack the way a well-tempered chocolate does. So crystallization is a whole area that we, um, we love showing uh, the students and we love talking about, and there's, there is a fair amount of research on that very subject because the whole 
subject of crystallization is, um, as opposed to a glass, it's important in materials uh, science. So ceramics and different mm -hmm. kinds of glasses and are are developed based on these principles. Yeah, I think I need to change my area of research. That's amazing. <laughs> That's really amazing. Does that have anything to do with ice cream? To crystallization and how you, you know, the temperature is. We always have trouble with, you know, if you let your ice cream melt and you can't refreeze it. Chocolate has its own set of uh, principles, but yes, I mean, the, the whole liquid to solid of going from uh, by lowering the temperature is, is how ice cream is created. In fact, in ice cream, the whole purpose is not to form crystals or to form crystals which are so tiny that they cannot really be uh, detected on your palate. So what's happening in the ice cream machine is that we take a liquid and then the drum is, is frozen cold and then a beater sort of uh, whips the ice cream around and scrapes it off the frozen wall faster than it can form into a large crystal. Mm -hmm. And that's why when you get these really soft, unctuous, delicious ice creams, <laughs> it's been... It's crystallized, but at such a quick, a fast rate that the crystals are very tiny. Wow. Now you're yeah, so, so hungry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, crystals is a whole other topic. If you've yeah. been in a cave, uh, you know, a wet cave or a dry cave, you, you know all about crystallization. There's, there's tons and tons of things to do with crystals uh, that relate all kinds of planets to food. So it's a whole other area of uh, things to go into. Chocolate is our favorite, however. So. <laughs> <laughs> Chocolate, yes. Definitely, definitely. Uh, I have to, to add in this, this lovely pun from Hugo Burnham. Uh, since we were talking about all life coming from sugar, uh, if, it all started what, if it all started with sugar, is that why the universe is expanding so fast? <laughs> <laughs> Very good. <laughs> It definitely has something to do with it. <laughs> Thank you, Hugo, for almost making me laugh out loud in the middle of them talking. <laughs> Great. I held it together. I held it together. Um, yeah, so uh, is there anything else you guys want to share in terms of what's coming next or where people can find more information about, about your demos? Uh, we're working on a book mm -hmm. and uh, developing a website, so stay tuned. Cool. Great. If you're in New York, uh, check out the Intrepid. We're we're apparently there quite often now. Yay, Intrepid! Yeah, I went as a little kid long before there was a space shuttle there, but yeah. Yeah, and if you're uh, in Hawaii, we'll be there in July, I think, in Hilo, uh, doing something else there. So, yeah, we're we're trying to up our uh, availability via a website and stuff. It's just um, we you know we have these other jobs, these day jobs. <laughs> Sometimes they get in the way. <laughs> yeah. yeah these, these real jobs get in the way. <laughs> there was one. There was one other question I, I just thought of. Um, I, my 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 baby quote baby cousin is at culinary school. Um, have you thought of adopting any of these lessons for culinary school? I don't know what their science requirements are like, but <laughs> well, the, the culinary schools are all over this, and there's uh, there's great people. Um, Francisco Magoya has a wonderful book that explores um, a lot of the culinary applications, and uh, he now actually works with Nathan Marvold, who is the sort of the chief guru of a lot of this cooking and science. Um, he wrote a book uh, called Modernist Cuisine, okay. uh, which which is um, six or seven volumes. <laughs> call it the coffee table book, which can also serve as a coffee table. It's really exhaustive. It's so exciting. But what is, I think, even more interesting is that... Um, there's all kinds of new stuff. I mean, the book is only two years old. There's, oh, he's already producing a lot of new uh, information, uh, so it's an ongoing process as it should be. And uh, the more people that get excited about both science and cooking, I think those are two areas in our country that we could use a boost, um, both in knowing what we eat and, and uh, 
caring for our own health and our children's health, as well as upping our game on the science level so that we can keep up with a competitive world. Very cool. Yeah. So just if I, I could, one, one last cook about one of our last experiences in a cooking school. Bill and I were using their kitchen to prepare for, for um, a demonstration we were giving. And the poor students, it was the day they were taking some final exam. Or, so they're out, they're trying to make a meal, and then they had to go into this room with their meal on a plate and have a tribunal of chefs pointing out things to them and whatever, and they're all under stress and that. So for a break, for them anyway, Bill and I were just cooking, and they, they started noticing things were going on weird in the little corner uh, kitchen we were in, and they started piling in to watch us because we had a pickle plugged into the wall. Thank <laughs> <laughs> you, do. <laughs> Doesn't every kitchen have that? Come on. <laughs> so um, that's what we oh. do. <laughs> that would get your attention. Yeah. So oh. relieve some of their stress. It was very yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Fun that's to you were, uh, Steve was showing them about the um, <laughs> that uh, pickle makes a, a pretty good conduit, and then until it gets completely closed. Uh, on its own, which is which is pretty awesome itself. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Well, uh, yeah. If you're ever, I'll have to send you to my cousin's school. I'm sure she'll be like, "Oh, no more astronomy." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Get from me. School, Rhode know. Island. I I don't remember the name, and I'm not wearing the shirt right now. So. <laughs> well, we always All guarantee right. fun. Anyway. Well, there's a lot of it. Um, a lot of not only culinary schools are including the science in their culinary programs, but some top universities are using um, food in their science programs. One of my favorites is at Georgia Tech, which is in, uh, it's one of the top five engineering schools in the country, and there's Professor Alberto Nieves there, and he does a uh, seminar every semester called Squishy Physics. <laughs> and uh, what Normal physicists might call soft matter physics. He calls squishy physics because it all revolves around food. Awesome. And squishy is a way better word. Yeah. Uh, totally. <laughs> oh, all right. Well, thank you guys so much. Yeah, um, I wanted to had one other joke uh, from Michael Jobin. Excessive heat on food gives you carbon. So... <laughs> <laughs> That's another whole other. Say that again. Give me that again. Excessive heat on food gives you carbon. Oh, right. <laughs> Very true. Yeah. That, that can happen. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but I want to thank you guys um, for sharing all these cool pictures and stories and, and ideas with us. Uh, we'll share the link to that story on Gemini. And I found the modernistcuisine.com. So oh, you can, excellent. Uh, excellent. check that out. Of course, the first thing on the page is dark chocolate when I opened it. <laughs> Good luck with that. <laughs> um, so thank you, Steve and Bill, for joining us, and especially Bill with all the, the tech stuff we went through. Finally got it working, so thank you so much. Oh, I'm glad. Uh, this was so much fun, Nicole. You, you really, uh, you, you're exactly the type of person we'd love to talk to because you get excited <laughs> about the intersections between yeah. the two subjects, and, and I think all of us understand them better when we can look at them through kind of a, this special angle. Totally. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So, Nicole and Georgia, thanks very much. It was a lot of fun. Oh, this was a great time. Thank you. We look forward to hearing uh, your your future books, projects, recipes. Yeah. Yeah, if you hear something we'll more, probably us. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Excellent. Thanks, everyone, Thank for you. watching, for commenting, for asking questions. I did want to point out over my shoulder, uh, thanks to James Dunbar. I haven't sent him a note yet. I need to send him a thank you note. Uh, last week we talked about the Universe Verse comic book, and you see it over my shoulder here if you're watching on the video. Cool. Uh, so we, we thank you for that copy. We will be sharing that with our local teachers here in Southern Illinois, so they can bring their the uh, comic, the graphic comic book history of the universe and and life and humanity to their students. So <laughs> cool beans on that. Thank you. Um, and that's it for today's show. Um, I don't. Uh, next week will be Pamela. We doing the science education. I don't remember what the topic is, but Pamela will be doing next week's uh, hangout on Wednesday. Um, the week, uh, the weekly space hangout I just heard was is canceled for Friday. Sorry, guys. Uh, looks like Fraser is on travel, uh, and I am at an outreach event, so I, w I can't step in and help there. Um, but keep an eye on the hangout schedule, of course, in the weekly space hangout crew group. 
Guido and, and Nancy, actually a bunch of people there are, are keeping up with the Hangout schedules that happen all around Google+. Plus. So thank you for that. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, that is it. We'll see you guys in either two or three weeks. We've got a hangout coming up about the Colors of Nature project. So Ooh. stay tuned. Yeah. All right, thank you, everybody. Okay, thanks, everybody. Uh, yeah. See you soon. Goodbye. Bye.